welcome to our new Mick Artistics Ego podcast. We'll be bringing you chat, insight, nonsense, laughter, music and a few surprises. And you can find out about our current activities and gigs, release news at mickartistic.com and on Facebook at Mick Artistics Ego Trip, as well as plenty of footage on our YouTube channel. And you can follow us on Twitter at Mick Artistic, at Johnny Ego Trip and at Ego Trip News. And today's guest is Jeff Hordley. Jeff Hordley, also known as Kane Dingle from the ITV soap Emmerdale, is an actor and is known as the baddie of the show. He's been in the cast for 20 years. At the 2007 British Soap Awards, he was nominated for Sexiest Male, Villain of the Year and Best Exit. And in today's show, we'll be talking about Courgette Cake, Snow Business, The Beta Band, The Brudenell Social Club, DJing in the 90s in Manchester, Drama School, working alongside his wife Zoe on Emmerdale, and how Ken Dingle is less of a maverick these days. Um, I'm eating cake. I'm eating some um, uh, courgette cake. I've Cause never had it. courgette cake in my life, and um, it's very pleasant. It's very subtle. It doesn't have uh, loads of sugar in it, which I like. Yeah. But I'm being I'm being polite. I'm sitting here <laughs> enjoying the subtleties yeah. of <laughs> courgette eat, cake. Eat our cake. Well, <laughs> we have an allotment which we're very proud of, and we. Uh, uh, it's not far from here actually and um <clears throat> there's a, a ton of courgettes at the moment so it's things to do we're pickling courgettes we're obviously eating courgettes the the, the kind of traditional way maybe so sticking a, pic- in a pasta. pickled courgette is a gherkin is it no well uh no a, a pickled a, a, a pickled uh gherkin is a cucumber all right okay. um, a courgette um pickled is as far as i'm aware is just pickled courgette all right. i could be wrong could be wrong. You're looking at me as if like I, no, you've got I, that wrong, Jeff. I, I bow to it. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking pretty at the sure. Green, I'm looking at this well-tended garden and uh, feeling um, just um, inspired. But I just look at lovely stuff like this because I have no, I don't have green fingers. Right. Yeah. My partner, she she does stuff with pots and yeah. buddleias yeah. and the, whatever the, these tiny little Japanese trees and stuff. Yeah. 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 And she. She's deadly. She's just wonderful. And I kill plants. People give me plants and I just... <laughs> oh, no, I kill them. Don't, don't, yeah. don't you worry. I, I, you know, sometimes things go wrong on the allotment, but um, the garden I can't take much credit for because we have a wonderful gardener who comes in and helps us out. So he kind of um, commands this space for us and makes it look great. But uh, the allotment is all our own doing. And it's all a bit of trial and error. But like I say, we've got courgette at the moment, which brings us back to the courgette cake. And and Zoe, my wife, um, oh, yeah. found, a, found a recipe the other day. You know, you've got carrot cake, which is mm. a lot sweeter. And then but you've this has just, just yeah. hit me now, and yeah. it's like a real, uh, it's almost like a hit sort of orange. Or There's a lemon of, zest lemon. on the top. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, that went in then. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's all right. So I thought I'd nice. share some <laughs> courgette cake with you. My so, cake's good. So this is the great, the great British Ego Trip pub. Uh, clamp down cake bacon. <laughs> right, this is everything, it boils down to a piece of cake. <laughs> I went on a, years ago, I went on a cookery course and there was a guy on it and, he, and we made a garden salad on day one from the cookery course's allotment as well and it was a cucumber and he put his hand up and he said, oh, I've never had cucumber, I'll give that a go. <laughs> and he must have been in his mid thirties, I'm thinking, how do you avoid cucumber that long? And what do you expect? It's just water, isn't it? Well, or see, is see, this is this is the this is, this is this is where the allotment uh, and I sound like an, an allotment snob here, but you know when you, you'll have heard this from many people. Yeah, but my t- the taste of my tomato from my allotment. When you pick them yourself and you grow uh, them yourself yeah. on your allotment. However, <laughs> there are certain vegetables that you grow on the allotment, um, and a cucumber is a prime example of it. I've given plenty to friends. Mm. There might even be one still in the fridge that we picked the other day, so I'll pass one on to you. But they are. They're quite, from a supermarket, yeah. they're quite tasteless, aren't they? And just kind yeah, of yeah. watery and, Well, they're nothing. You know, they're, they are nothing. I mean, they're more like, However, bit, they're more like something decorative you stick on top of you. Yeah. You slice them really fine and you just log them on. And, yeah. And, uh, but you're people, homegrown. People have sweet. cucumbers, they used to have cucumber sandwiches and you think, well, what are they eating? <laughs> well, yeah. you taste the butter of the bread, don't you? But yeah. a cucumber sandwich, you know. Mm. And um, But uh, our cucumbers taste very sweet ah interesting yeah okay. and i don't know whether it's because we we're not mass producing them 
or we're not putting any pesticides on them, but mm. they do taste a lot better. Or whether it's just because you're hacking them straight away and you're eating them within a day or so. So yeah, how do you, how do you really? What do you do? Do you, do you go in with a knife and just kind of have the stick, yeah, and, cucumbers, have the stick it about the ground? No, they're, they're like a vine plant. So they're, they're, I've got a polytunnel, and inside there there'll be tomatoes, there'll be there'll be um, there'll be chilies, there'll be cucumbers, and um, and what else have I got in there? I've got lots of other, th- just things that like the heat. Well, the cucumbers, they're like on a vine, so they, they go everywhere. All right, and so they're sticking out. Yeah, and you have to kind of put posts in and, 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 and string, and you have to tie them up to that, and then they just kind of hang down, and then you just kind of snip them with scissors and take them off. But whatever size you want to let them grow. If you want yeah. them to grow big, leave them on for long. If you want them kind of nice and small, then just... We might have to get a photograph of some of those. Yeah, put we can do the, that. We'll put them on the website, the podcast. We can do page. that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the sound of a ball bouncing yeah. in Jeff Hordley's garden. And uh, that's the sound of the dog listening to the ball, the echo of the ball. That my son, my, my son and his friend uh, are just, uh, are just come out. They've just been watching a film together and they've decided to come out and uh, bounce on the trampoline. <laughs> And now that they're kind of they're, they're kind of skulking away now, as if like they've disturbed. Because they've been basically right, you can they've play. Been pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> there's this, there's a curiosity there, but it's it's a sly curiosity. <laughs> so how how um, how are, how are your kids handling this this three months of uh, of lockdown? How's everybody handling? How's you? How, yeah, how are you I mean, do you know? Um, the, there's, there's been highs and there's been lows, but but generally I've, I've found the, um, or we've found as a family, this, the stopping uh, of, of everything has, has been, has been the, there's some positives in there for us as a family because we've done, we live in a place that's kind of semi-rural, so we have this, these lovely little kind of walks where you didn't see many people, so you could be quite, you know, you can go for an isolated dog walk and we'd go for an hour, say, with the dog and just the four of us and just mm. chat a lot. So, you know, I've got a 12 year old son who's just started high school and I've got a, Stan. A, Stan, and I've yeah. got Violet who's just about to, she's going into a GCSE the year this year. So, you know, it's been, it's, it's been really good as a family to have, I knew that would happen. <laughs> it's not my agent. We, uh, um, we, we met Stan uh, two days ago, me and uh, my sister Margaret were in town having a coffee outside a uh, Pret a manger, and uh, Jeff went past with his red, unobtrusive woolly hat on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and glasses. <laughs> I thought I'd say something to him, and uh, and then I said something to him, and, and my sister Margaret was like in a, going into a sort of a sort of a catatonic fit or something. Because <laughs> uh, and my mother said, "Oh, Kane, what you're going to see Kane tonight?" I said, "I am. I'm off to see Kane tonight." <laughs> so, uh, but my Margaret was like, and then and. You very gallantly said, "Oh, we'll do a little film, you know, if you want, you know, just." And I think the film never turned out or something. Oh, you're so we got we got like a snap of you, kind of like there's a segment of your face and like a bit of your your jacket or something. But you know, she was my sister was made up, you know. Oh, so, no, so, so it's going the rounds around Nabwood. Right. This story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the film I, that never happened. So tell us, tell us. Uh, so you've got you've had so you've had three months and uh, it's been like what. It's been, it been like? it's been like there's, there's been highs and lows because I, I, I think for my children as well they've, they've, they've reacted to it in different ways at different times um, my aunt um, asked um, my she's a great aunt actually she's called my aunt Auntie Suze and uh, she, she really teases the best out of the children because she speaks to them on, the, on, on as an adult would speak to them so she asked my son it was about three weeks ago what's been the the best thing about lockdown, and um, and my son said, um, getting Ronald the dog because we've got this. We managed to get a puppy at the beginning of the lockdown, and he's he's been a great focus for Stan. Whenever he's been feeling a, a wee bit kind of down or just frustrated that he's not seeing his mates, the dog's been been a, a real lift for him. Whereas my daughter, she said, and Violet, what's been the what's been the worst thing about lockdown for you? And she's very honest, uh, and she said it so straight and true. She just said, spending too much time with my family. <laughs> but she, she was only being honest, and my, and my yeah. auntie didn't kind of react and go, oh, that's not very nice. She went, yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. and she, you know, she yeah. was only being honest, and it is, it's been hard for us all, because we're not used to being yeah. 
in the mm. four walls together 24-7. Common story, I think. Well, that's, that, that's yeah. for example, Johnny's on his own. Yeah. He manages on his own how the hell he does. I'm there with my partner of 22 years, yeah. me and her older people, whatever, sitting in a in a terrace in Armley yeah. and with three cats milling around. Yeah. That's us. And yet there's... And I often wonder about sort of my friends and people who have got kids. How, how do you sort of... How do you stay sane when you've got like, you know, children 12, 13, 14... How do you how do you keep a sort of a happy ship? You know. I think I think for us um, we we've been lucky that we've got this like lovely outside space here, and we live like say we live in this area where we, we can go for walks. So I think that kept us safe. And going back to to what we we're talking about earlier, the, the plants and the allotment, um, I found without sounding all kind of um, hippie about it, but just literally putting my hands in the earth and, mm -hmm. and, and watching life grow has been really has been a really positive thing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's only been in close quarters with it during this lockdown that's made me realise what a wonderful thing it is to have that allotment and to yeah. watch life grow, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, you don't even, for me, I was talking to a friend of mine and I went to see my mate up in Roundy uh, called Bankside Pete, who's a clown, and he made some coffee for me and we were sitting there and he starts to talk about some obscure film or something, mm. and, and he's full of crazy nonsense. And I'm, I was just distracted by this little bee that just mm. floated at, just out of stage right, and it was just going into like a, a flower. Into, and, and I looked at it, I thought, you know, that's, that's amazing. Mm. That's, it, it kind of stopped me in my tracks for about like, I'm thinking, you know, just the grandeur of this mm. planet. You, you don't have to have, you, you could just kind of look out and you've got this vast blue above mm. you mm. that it's got sort of subtle shifts and colours and that and it's grand, you know, and we don't, because we're sort of running around trying to pay the bills and trying to get our kids here or, through, or, or trying to get, you know, some, uh, go through some golden door mm. in our career or something, it's like, well, there's so much kind of treasure. Mm, already there. there. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think, well, just talking to Johnny on the way, that I think there's going to be stuff like um, political parties are going to have to change. The, sh the shift of people like sort of the Tories and Labour and, Lib and, Lib and the Liberals, whatever, that they can't fob us off with, oh, you know, well, we're going to have sort of uh, um, um, socialism or with... Um, Thatcherism or something, you mm. know, that, that, because this has really kind of laid waste to so many sort of like, sort of um, old sort of pillars of sort of uh, thought, you know. Mm. It's, 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 you know, it's like ground zero now. Almost. Well, we've all experienced yeah. it. We've been through it all together, mm. haven't we? Whether you're, I know that it, there's, there's varying degrees of how you, people will have, have dealt with it, but generally we've all been affected by this as a planet, so... That, that creates a, a, a commonality for everyone, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? That they mm. can they can uh, all relate to, albeit, you know, I know that some people will have had some really tough times in this because I, I kind of think of what about, like yourself, I thought, my friend who was just trying to ring then, actually, who's, who's a musician yourself, mm. like yourselves, and uh, he's, um, he's had gigs lined up and he's had to cancel them. And he's been in his flat, in Manchester on his own, you know, but we spoke on we we did, we kind of did a did a lot of those Zoom calls. Yeah. That had a, a few little pockets of friends that we did Zoom calls every week. We're and, all uh, Zoomers. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? But that also taught me something as well. The whole Zoom thing, because there was a certain set. Of, there was some some friends that, that lived down in Oxford uh, or near Oxford, and um, they uh, we, know, we we always kind of put something in the diary once a year. And sometimes something might come up and one of us goes, we'll have to cancel this one date that we've set. Mm. And we always go, but when we do get, when we see each other, it's like, they're, they're the kind of friends that we just pick up. There's no yeah. like, oh, I haven't heard from you for a yeah. while. They're yeah. just, just good, good mates. Click straight yeah. Away, yeah. But we did a Zoom call with them and we just literally, start, we, said, we said seven o'clock and then it was literally one o'clock in the morning <laughs> about two you know, two bottles of wine later. Yeah. But we just all had a really good catch-up and, and it just made me go, yeah, 
we, that's what we can do if ever in the future we yeah. can't make that trip to Oxford or they can't make it up here. We'll just zoom. zoom. It's we'll just zoom. So that's a, that's a positive, isn't it? Yeah. You know? yeah. That's a new t shirt. Yeah. yeah. We'll just zoom. We'll just zoom. <laughs> so I so, guess filming is all off at the moment, is it? No, filming is back. Is it back on? Filming is back on. And uh, you, have you been back on set? Or? I've been back on set. I was. They did. They were really keen not to go off air, I think, because I just think that they wanted. They wanted to keep it going because they had so much in the can. Mm. So in so it hasn't got so basically it's just it's 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 kept, it's kept going, going, it's right kept the way going but they they what they've done is they've pulled they've pulled um, some of the episodes out just so that it's out of the schedule. So normally you'd get six episodes on a week on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday one one double episode or whatever, and they've stripped that back to three. So whereas they had say four weeks ahead with six episodes a week they stripped it back to three though therefore they had eight weeks ahead mm. so that gave them a bit of time but then they came up with an idea to write these two handers about lockdown oh. of which i was asked to do one with danny miller and that was great it was a uh, we shot a whole episode in a day socially distant we were as far as i'm aware so were you, were you involved in the writing bit? Or no, no, I wasn't involved in the writing. So of that, it, Danny's, Danny, Danny plays Aaron. So it was about Kane and Aaron in lockdown, and he talked about his relationship, and I talked about mine, but in a kind of in the in the in the, the life of the characters because they're mm. not very kind of forthright, not very good with words, particularly my character. So we shot these. This we 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 were lucky that we had a rehearsal. We went in. We had a rehearsal day. And then we went in to shoot it, and, and, and there were six episodes that they did for this lockdown, off to 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 to, to kind of um, to say just to kind of note that lockdown has happened or that the that COVID has happened. Mm. So we did these, and as to my knowledge, we were the first TV production company to 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 do this. So oh. I think you know. We paved the way for the first time, I think. Yeah. And 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 I've had various actors who work in various uh, parts of the industry. There's a guy who's who's working on the Batman film, and he was going, "What? How did you do it? What's happening? You know? Because yeah. mm. everybody's keen to know how you do it. And they've just been really strict to ITV, with the two meter, with uh, a stick, and and things like that, and keep making sure everybody is kept. At, so is, at is the canteen running? No. That, well, so, so, you know, there, so if you so if you were to go in now for lunch, yeah. you have a lunch packet, which you pick up. You get, there's a menu sent to you by email, and you'll kind of go, oh, "I'll have the vegetarian option," <laughs> or that, and you just go yeah. and pick it up at lunchtime. It's good to go. It's really, yeah, it's really yeah. very, it's very different. Mm. Um, but and I, I mean, uh, now that you've you're sort of doing a bit, uh, I do you have to kind of. Uh, exercise your skills every day sort of thing or or do you just sort of you know like you've got to sort of learn lines and stuff when you mm. do it but now that you're not you're, now that you're only able to turn up maybe um how do you sort of look after yourself as an actor how do you sort of keep your do you, do you, do you sort of practice stuff in here on your own or what or? um no I, i've just always uh i mean everybody looks at it the approach it differently i've always i have to look at scripts days before there's certain actors who work on the show who can look at things in that before because they can't retain lines for that long but for me i need to look at them night the night uh, a good few nights before mm. so the scripts are still we're still doing the scripts now we've, we've dropped the lockdown episodes now we're back into the, the normal episodes but I think it was a fr- I think it was a friend of mine the day who's an avid fan and I spoke to him, and he kind of said, "Well, those lockdown episodes were terrible because now <laughs> it's just gone back to normal. So it's like we've had the COVID, but now that but now they're back in the pub. But what I think what they what happened was, as we went into lockdown, we'd kind of half done a set of episodes, mm. and then they and then they stopped them, then they did the lockdown episodes and they put those out." And then they put the other half of the, of the, on the that other side, like yeah, the on the side. So, so it, there's something a bit kind of un. And, it, and I think you've just got to. You, I just think like like everything when people do watch, um, you know, continuing dramas, soaps, you've got to have a little bit suspend your disbelief. One because it's a village or a street where a lot of crazy things happen, mm-hmm. but two, 
you know, we're shooting all year round and sometimes the blocks take two or three weeks and people are, I think, people are always quick to kind of criticise, aren't they? You know, especially mm. with the world of social media now. And what I mean by that is they'll go, oh, are they not socially distancing? Now they are socially distancing. It's like, well, there's been a pandemic and we've done our best to work around it. Please be lenient. You know, yeah. likewise, when it's winter time and you get an episode or, or, or a block where it was snowing and then it was really sunny at the end. So a guy's walked out of the pub and it's gone into snow and then the next thing you've seen another guy that was shot at the end of it and it's bright sunshine. Yeah. Somebody's gone, Why, what's happened to the weather in Emmerdale? It's like, <laughs> we shot it over three weeks. <laughs> you know, but that's just, that is that is the world of television, isn't it? But, yeah. you know, we, we're, we've just not got enough of a budget to get, um, uh, I don't know if you ever, uh, there's been a company once, Mick, who, who came in because they needed it to be like winter. So this company came in and frosted the whole outside. And it was like, I was like, what are they using? And they were just using icing sugar. But the best the best bit about this company, and I think they're quite big in the industry, I think they don't just work on soaps and, and dramas, they work in film. They're called Snow Business. <laughs> which is the best name, isn't it? You know? Love it. No ambiguity there. Yeah. So what have you and Zoe done then? You know, I mean, like, you know, like the, when, you, when you're not kind of minding um, your, your children, how, how have you sort of escaped from like sort of lockdown? Uh, I mean, apart from walking your dog, I mean, have, you, have, you been, have you been making bread or knitting or something? Well, we like, we like, um, we do like, um, we like cooking a lot. So we've done a lot of that. We Zoom call, we've had a, a, a group of, friends that we do a weekly quiz Zoom with, which has been always a good thing to look forward to. Um, it's quite common, that, isn't it? Yeah. Zoom quizzes, I think. But uh, generally, you know, we've, we've got on each other's nerves at time, yeah. but, but we've also, but we, because we've been together for such a long time, we know each other so well, so we we know that that, that happens, and that happens even without uh, a, yeah. a lockdown situation. Yeah. Um, I think. So you, how do how do you manage when like you've, you've had a like because you're 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 on set, and maybe things aren't good because you've you've had a row and stuff. Yeah. So how how do, how do you do, how do you sort of uh, navigate that? How do you navigate? Then you have to go home together and you have to cook. cook well, you know, I don't, I don't think I don't think we've, we're not the kind of people to to harbour grudges. So I, I can honestly say that we've never had one of those times where we've been on set and gone speaking to you at the moment. That's never really happened. So, so just um, to be clear, like because some of the listeners might not realise, so, so you both you both on the show. Yes. Yeah, so Zoe seen... plays Rona. She plays the vet in Emmerdale. But the beauty right. of her character, my character, is that she works in a kind of a different part of the village to me, or a diff- with a different set of of uh, people in the village than yeah. me. So I very rarely work with her. Hmm. So I only ever see her sometimes in a in a, a wall pack scene, and it's fine. I think people kind of know that we're all right and people know us quite well at work because we've been there for a while so yeah it's it's, it's very it's, it's really strange because i'm sitting here opposite you and and you play kane dingle yeah. and dingle is is like i could i can remember seeing so i, I I'm, I'm on the sh- i do sort of extra work yeah. on the show with you and i yeah that's part of my earning uh I, I i do my gigs most people know me as somebody who performs and uh, this kind of comedy, rock and roll stand-up. Yeah. Plus, some people know me as the guy who draws on brown paper bags around Leeds. <laughs> but also, I, I've, I've kind of, when the weather's been harsh and uh, when I've, 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 I've had sort of 20, 25 years of whatever as an extra on Emmerdale, you yeah. know. And uh, it's, um, and your, your character is, is the villain, is, mm. the, is the, the Rasputin, the black arts, yeah. And yet, um, it's really strange to meet you. This to meet you, yeah. Because the the, the character. Well, you see me more on set, being yeah, being yeah, this yeah. moody uh, person who. Well, uh, you know, you're always you know. We, we, yeah, yeah. We chat, yeah. we chat, but it's very gurning and, yeah, yeah. and eyebrows yeah, scowling. Going, yeah. yeah, that's why yeah. I've got to be creasing. Between yeah. I was looking at the other day, going, Jesus, I think that's just years of playing this character and being just generally perplexed with the world, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But, but it's just weird because it's, because, because the actual, the persona is, is, is very mild mannered and very, yes. you know, and just very placid. Yeah. And it's, it's so freaky. 
Because yeah. <laughs> people get that to me, they say when I'm on stage, you know, yeah. say, oh God, you, you, look, you were looking at me through the, through the whole set. And I said, I wasn't, you know, I've just got big eyes, you yeah. know, I just yeah. have starey eyes. I'm, I'm a coward, yeah. a physical coward, you know. And they see me yeah. on stage, you know, they just see this, they're going, how come, what, how come, you're not the same. No. How, yeah. you know, you're really different, you know, yeah. you're really shy. Yeah, so it's, that's it's, the same. It's, I'm very like that, but it's funny, I think I, I was um, blessed or not blessed with a, a, a thick pair of eyebrows and a, a, probably a scowl that I didn't even realise was happening on my face because, like you say, at school, I was known as a pretty... Th- th- there would have been people I know I knew from my senior school that may have watched Emmerdale since and gone, well, that's Jeff Percy. I used to, I used to give him grief at school. Do you know what I mean? He's right, soft ass. <laughs> but I also would have you know in between you move from one class to another you know the bell goes and then you move from science to to english or something and you're all walking in the corridor bags are flying and yeah and people are, but you, i just used to get on with my day and go to where i was going and then i'd see my mates at lunchtime we go what was up with you between science and english and go what <laughs> looking at me like you wanted to kill me and I'd be like sorry I didn't even re-, you know but it's just because I've got it's this kind eyebrows. of it's just the eyebrows <laughs> in my eyes it's nothing I can do about yeah, it so yeah. it's, it's like Johnny Rotten I mean he's got this sort of psychotic yeah. psychotic step but he actually was a medical condition he had yeah. sort of like uh, something wrong with his uh, yeah, he, he had like uh, some child you know some, some difficult disease like polio or something right, when he was a right. kid and, and it affected his uh, you know his Features, yeah, the way he looks. So, yeah. and he wasn't, you know. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm sitting in this lovely shed, uh, which is <laughs> my man cave. Man cave. But I'm, I'm looking at you've got Steve Mason on the wall behind yes. you, and uh, I just love that. I love that. I just love that artwork on that poster. Yeah. I mean, the gig was brilliant, and I loved the Beta so, Band. Yeah, me too, you know. Um, I mean, when those... That's that EP of The three that, EPs came oh, that's out. that's astonishing, I mean, that. Yeah, it yeah. really blew my mind, that. Because uh, yeah. obviously, you, you know, I absolutely love music and the Brood and Ellen and, and Nathan and stuff like that. It's it's like a a second home to me. In fact, I, I, was, I, I was 50 this year and I was seriously thinking about trying to have a big party at the Brood and Ellen, but it's, it's going to have to wait for another time, mm-hmm. I think. But, um, yeah, it's that's... One of the uh, so who have you seen at the Brood now then? That's, that's oh, of your boys? Do you know I've seen so much? I've never seen you. That's the one thing. I, I keep, I keep, I keep saying I'm going to well, come maybe, and I never turn up. <laughs> well, maybe we're not. Maybe you're not meant to see. No, them, I am. Maybe, I maybe am. It'll just be too confusing for you. I am, and uh, it's always Christmas time when because because my family live in Scotland and Zoe's family live in. In Essex, it's always you're always on over Christmas, aren't you? Like I've come to that, and it's like I can't come to that one because we're well, in Essex. We were at Latitude as well. You missed me at Latitude. I missed you. I didn't know you were on. I didn't even know you were on at Latitude. Mm. That's the thing. But um, Brood and L, I've seen kind of things like the you know you've gone from like the zombies, the pretty things, Georgie Fame, you know that the, those kind of old oh, wow. classics. So, so that's your to, no to 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 kind of Steve Mason to Herman June to. You know, Who's uh, Herman love, June? Herman, oh, have you not heard Herman June? No. So I, th- I think they're like a French Scandinavian band, but really lo-fi and very witty lyrics. In fact, oh. the, the, the in fact the um, the you know the Brood and L Social Club, the the bear thing. That was drawn by I think the uh, the guy who's in Herman June. All oh, right, right. Okay. I think Nathan really likes them, and uh, I came across them quite a few years ago. And there's a, there's an album called Giant, and it just really struck a chord with me, and it, it kind of quickly moved into my you know like top tens. You know like you have you know yeah, I, can, yeah. I can never I never I can never say what's your favorite album, but I can kind of I can kind of reel a few out if you just went top ten albums. You go okay, this this and this and this, you know, yeah. and that kind of moved into that. So you should. Should check them out. Mm. Herman June, June, Giant, Giant. Yeah. And Daft Punk as well. But, but Daft, Daft Punk. Punk. Daft Punk, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's I, a, that's a, I like the poster. That's the first album, I like, Daft Punk. Uh, yeah, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, uh, good stuff. I got my... my, my oh, is it Homework? It's Homework, the first album. I think Daft Punk is on it, isn't it? Something I think like so, that. yeah, yeah. Because I, I got my girlfriend, Kath, who's she's into stuff like the Pete Bob Fair, or she was, she's into kind of like... Pete Bog Fairies and bloody uh, kind of world music and Walmart stuff. Right. Uh, and she wasn't into kind of house music or yeah. that kind of funk club stuff. 
Uh, but she, I don't know what happened, but I, I, I must have put my foot down. But she, she started to get the Daft Punk uh, virus, and yeah, she's yeah. like, and she, she bought, she, she and then, uh, and I remember her, um, getting, getting her into half man, half biscuit. This, this band from uh, the Wirral, who are yeah. like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, well, uh, and she was saying, oh, it's lads, it's just lads, they're just so oh, annoying, yeah, you know, because I was playing these songs about. Uh, uh, what's it? Everybody's doing the everybody's doing the Bob Gamley stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she said it's, it's lad stuff, and then about sort of within sort of a month, she was like, I was buying her yeah. half man half biscuit yeah. albums, and like she just she knows all the songs now. God yeah. gave us life. <laughs> <laughs> now we so you do a bit of DJing as well, I believe. I just I do. Yeah, um, that's been my one. Uh... Do you know that's been a, that's been a vice in, in, in lockdown. I've, I've been lucky enough to uh, be able to af- afford a, an old pastime of mine and, and, and reignite it, which is uh, buying vinyl again. So I've suddenly been buying vinyl all the time because there was um, I used to DJ at a club in Manchester called the Rock and Roll Bar years ago. Um, so what sort of stuff would you be playing? So it, it 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 was um it was a guy who ran one of the nights at Hacienda and he came up with this idea in 1996 to kind of do a club where, you know that when you come home from a club after house music and then you just go and you play everything. You'd put on, you wouldn't just go on and carry and listen to house music. Mm. You'd listen to hip hop, you'd listen to maybe a bit of guitar music, you'd maybe put some Pink Floyd on, you'd just, it'll st- the music would just start to, you put funk on. And, yeah. and that's what the rock and roll bar became, this kind of, melting pot of, of, of different Reflective. sounds yeah. Um, yeah and and that was really up my street at the time so it, it was a kind of guitar 60s so um, where was where was that then where was south that? nightclub mm. oh, it was 90, great 96 now I, I i think i started oh maybe it was 94 it started i think i started in 96 yeah and i carried on djing there until about 2000 yeah that's probably I did about 10 years there and it was great. But we had some incredible guests on there mm. over the years. We had John Peel twice and so I was so lucky enough was to kind of... Kind of a rock club then it was... It was really yeah, well, it was it was everything really. It, yeah. You know, you Daft Punk would, would sit next to Northern Soul, would sit next to the teen, Teenage Kicks, would sit next to the Stone Roses. Yeah. You know, it was, it, mm. it, was, it was everything reggae. It was everything and anything. It wow. was, so it was, were you acting at that time as well? Yeah. Yeah. And the amount of actors who, like in Manchester, because it was quite near the Royal Exchange, that would, they would be friends of friends in plays. And I've met many actors who I've seen since and gone, I came to that club that you used to DJ. <laughs> and, you know, it was really good that people used to get, it was, I think it's quite a, a little institution for the people that went to this club, you know. And right. like I say, it was, it was of a, a certain standard that we got really facet, you know, brilliant guests. Mm. And how did that lead into your starting on Emmerdale? How did that all happen? But what were you doing? Were, were you acting? Were you, were you, what were you doing before Emmerdale then, in '96 then? What so, sort of stuff were you doing? Uh, well, I think it, I graduated in '96. No, I didn't. I graduated. Did no, yeah, yeah, I graduated in '96, and that's what. And that's when I. I used to DJ at parties at uh, at drama school, you know, like house parties, mm-hmm. I mean, like someone's house, that kind of thing. So um, suddenly after leaving uh, drama school, I suddenly realised that uh, acting wasn't going to make me a lot of money and I needed to do other things. I couldn't just sign on and wait for a job to happen. So I literally went round some bars in Manchester with a cassette, which is how old it was, <laughs> a cassette, a mixed cassette and okay. passed it. And passed it on to uh, to bars in Manchester, and then I, I DJed at Ten Bar, and and then the next thing I was DJing at this this rock and roll bar, this club in Manchester, mm. and then um, what was the other place? Was it the, the board? Was it the, is it the board? Was it the board? What's boardwalk. the one? The boardwalk. Yeah, it's not there anymore now. Is it the boardwalk? I did a night there as well. So I was doing. So I was doing that, and then I was starting to act, uh, and acting took. It didn't take off massively to begin with. Hmm. Was it so? Was it telly you were doing, or was it like? I was theater? doing everything. I was doing theatre. I was doing radio. I was doing telly, but I was doing bit parts on telly. So by the time I'd come to Emmerdale, which was two thousand, I was four years out, 
and I'd probably done about 10 TV jobs, but, you know, maybe six of them were like a copper in two scenes, you know what mm. I mean, or a nightclub manager in Coronation Street. So, so there's... You've got, you got like a sort of a grounding then, you just... Yeah, you, yeah, so I kind of did... did your you, you push-ups, basically. Yeah, just to, yeah, I did so an yeah. Emmerdale very quickly, uh, the, the work accelerated or, 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 or being on a set accelerated because you were doing it day in, day out. So, mm. you know, I managed to learn a lot then but the the audition came along um in uh 2000 and um i went for the for the meeting i remember kind of looking at the breakdown and it was kind of like manchester throwback <laughs> and i was like oh yeah, here we go Is that, what you, <laughs> that, that, that was the character breakdown was a right. manchester throwback with a mancunian haircut and at the time i had a long yeah. kind mm. of haircut because you know that's i suppose because it was from manchester and um um, and so yeah, I kind of I know on paper I was like, all right, this this is this is quite positive on paper. So all I'm going to have to do is go in there and make and sure that I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> give, me, give me the eyebrows. make sure I, I, I can do it. And um, and I do remember going into the audition and seeing the producer. And it's this has only happened twice in my career where you can literally see. And I sound like I'm, I sound like I'm full of myself here, but he, he's like it's almost like his eyes pops out of his head because it because I think. He saw, it. he saw what was on the page, wanted, and I yeah. thought, "Oh, this this seems promising." And and sure enough, I, I read it, and and then I got a recall, and then and then and then I so, got the job. But the, it was sometimes I think there's there's a there's a there's, there is you know when you hear that right place, right time. Yeah, yeah no, I think so because yeah. some actors like it doesn't matter what you sort of. I, I've kind of met a few actors here and there, and they said that you know we t- we go to 50, 60 oh, auditions, yeah. Yeah. and. And it doesn't matter what your history is, whether you've done Shakespeare, Beckett, blah, blah, yeah. blah. If, you f- if you're not what they want, it doesn't matter how many, how much dues you paid. Yeah. It can be a kid who's like, who's just been active for three weeks and yeah. walks in, and they just say, sorry, uh, uh, Ian McKellen, uh, it's what I've been the Donald here. Yeah. Because he's the paper boy. He, he works. Yeah. You know? and, and it's like, and then you just have, Ian McKellen has to just, do the walk of shame. Yeah, no, so, that's so, true. So, so it's like there's a lot of, I suppose, a lot of walking of shame. You know, there's you know people that oh, all these these stars are there and they're they're living this cosseted life, but you've got to have a, a, a constitution, I yeah. iron to to take the refusals and uh, yeah to just be sort of bat around the the, uh, the floor and stuff. I yeah. suppose. Yeah, um, it's it's more about knockbacks um, than than being actually. You know, you might have twelve auditions in a year and you get three of them. And the amount of, oh, you know, the one that got away, I could tell you about, you know, when you've got penciled in or you, you've almost got the job and then mm. the programme goes out or the play goes out and then you go, could have been me, but so it just wasn't, you know. So yeah. what, what happened, why, why was there a gap between 2000 and, uh, and, and the space between you coming on doing Kane and then there was a gap in between when, when, you, when you weren't, when you left for a while? Oh, you mean when I, so I did... You mean in Emmerdale? In Emmerdale, So yeah, I yeah. did 2000, 2006, and I think I just got to a point where I wanted to... Because uh, I'd only been four years out of drama school, so I kind of thought, this is the... Um, I haven't kind of ticked all the boxes I want to tick. I'd, I'd done... There were some little places that I, I wanted to work in London and things like that, and uh, I left kind of wanting to kind of fulfil those things. And um, during the, I did three years out there, and I managed to, to kind of do that. But also, I've got Zoe who who had um, looked after our daughter for a few years and and stopped working. Um, so we kind of said that if, whoever got the biggest job hmm. in you know one side left, so that if she got a bigger job, then and I would look after the children. Yeah. And sure enough, that happened. Zoe ended up being in Coronation Street for a year, and I sat back and looked after the kids for about a year as well. So there was a year where I was only maybe doing the radio plays, or I think I did a play and a radio play, or a couple of radio plays. So how did you feel about, I guess, if you get the opportunity to be a character in a soap, because they're, cause they're so big mm. nationally and internationally, and people perceive you as being that character. How, how, how does that feel for you to think, right, I'm going to be known from now on as this person and my own identity is going to be a bit anonymous I did you know I didn't um, I really never imagined it being what it's become mm. I remember driving over the M62 in 2000 
because obviously I knew who the Dingles were. Mm. And there was a little bit of a kind of like driving there, just driving over to the studios at Emmerdale and going, oh my God, I'm going to be a Dingle. You know, it was a, <laughs> it was a real kind of shock because I knew who Zach was and I knew who Marlon was and Butch and they were quite, so quite we, an did iconic you watch, family. Did you, watch, did you watch it before? I you... hadn't watched it as a fan, but I just knew them. And I'd, I'd, I'd been fascinated by them because they were kind of the underclass, weren't they? And I liked, I liked what we stood for. So the weeds. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to be to be joining that family was quite exciting for me. But Johnny, I, I never really thought about whether it would turn into this part that it's turned into. Mm. The contract was initially for three months and another three months, and then the three months after that. And then once I got to the, the end of the year, then they offered me a year. And then and how it's long been like that. that. Did, what, how long have you been on the show then? Now? So I did those six, almost 16, 17. I joined, I joined in 2000, left in 2006. Joined again in 2009. And so 17 years. Wow. So Which, do, you, do, you you know, get a, do you get a chance to sort of like slip off and do other I, little projects? Do you know what I did in my first six years, I was really lucky that uh, the producers let me go out and do three plays. So I did a, I did two plays over at the Bolton Octagon. Mm. One as a play that I'd always wanted to do, which is uh, I've been fascinated with this kind of um, Strindberg, which is a kind of, you know, from the Chekhov period, mm-hmm. very naturalistic, but it's about a... a, 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 a a butler and he and he's and he's and and the the young daughter of the house on a midsummer eve and he's the he's the kind of head butler and she's the daughter of the, the family that he works for and then there's this night where they and it's all about him trying to break the glass break ceiling. Break to, to be <laughs> to get from the working classes up to the, the top house. Yeah. There's, 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 poten- there's a potential to sort of like yeah, a, ma- a, a connection between two classes. Yeah, I'd always there. and I'd always connected to that, that upstairs down thing, you know, which which you know, which is uh, uh, what's it called, Downton. It's you know, it's, mm. it, it it was it was like that, but ten times better, you know, the all the players, and it and the, the both the characters just end up messed up at the end of the play but it's pretty much a two-hander so I was, I was lucky that I got the chance to do that then there was another play that I was fascinated with which is a, which um, Steve Halliwell actually who plays that dingle knows uh, David Halliwell who wrote this play this play that back in the late 70s I think it's called Little Malcolm and his struggle against the units and it's just about these northern art students and just this madcap story that they have and they all listen to jazz and, but it's very very wacky and funny mm. and I think it was done on, at the Royal Court at the time and then this David Halley was well, Halley was going to be a great writer and I think Steve worked with him on his second play and I just think the, the guy just what never kind of produced the work that he did in, in mm. with, with Little Malcolm you know Are you from an acting family then? No No Just um, what you wanted to study all, all I know is my granddad was in the Navy and he was a bit of a singer and my nan's always been my granddad never saw me kind of perform on stage or anything so I think she was always like that's that's your granddad that <laughs> she's a, she's a proper Mac Nana is my, my, my nan and she's she's um, you know she's like your granddad yeah that's you, you get that from your granddad you get your singing from your granddad not that I've got a great voice but so you do know. you sing then? I, d- I can sing I can sing yeah and I have done uh I did Oh What a Lovely War and um and I did a th- Animal Farm which is more um so Animal Farm uh, is a musical. Animal yeah, Farm. it's not not, but it, it's got music in it. But it's like a Brechtian type music. Mm-hmm. So it's not you. You sing the song and it tells the story, and then you just carry on acting. You don't sing the song, wait for the applause, yeah. and then carry on. Yeah. You you sing the song and just carry That's on. That's like oh, what a lovely war. Hmm. It's not. It's meant to hit you around the face. It's not. It's not. You, you don't break the fourth wall, as it were. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, so you just stay in it. Did, have you have you been in a band? Have you ever sort of no. entertained the thought of like singing in a band? No, I've I've never. I've, I, but the first time ever, I I uh, I managed to sing last year with my cousin and his mates. We had a bit of a kind of mad. Uh, he had a bit of a mad fiftieth, and his and and his mates are all musos from from bands in Scotland and quite well known bands. So. They they all jammed together, mm. and um, there was probably about twelve of us, and uh, and then they, they uh, 
every night they'd play because we were there for about five nights and, and every night they'd play because this, this, they, they were all they'd had to set everything up and on about the second or third night the drummer was like why aren't you singing I was like ah, sing he's like do you not it's not a song that you could sing and I was like yeah I suppose because like, come on everyone's having a go there were guys who weren't bass players getting up and playing bass yeah. there were yeah. everyone was shaking something just having off, a go, yeah. just yeah. Having a go yeah. you know and there were people so I went all right, tomorrow I'll do it. So I got up and I sung, I sung which is on the wall there, Moon Age Daydream. And, um, and uh, I sung it and uh, these guys are all really, you know, kind of well-known, music, established musicians, you know what I mean? Yeah. They were just like, um, fucking hell, you know, where, where have you been hiding that? And I was like, they were, they, were, they were really genuine you yeah, know what I mean and yeah, yeah. so I must have sung in tune but um, yeah no this, it's great that was, yeah, I remember just I was, having having the just to, to play with a, a live band it was so um, exhilarating do you know what I mean and I, I, I was I was a bit drunk as well because we'd had a few drinks so I think my my I was relaxed and, and I, I just had a great time you know yeah yeah it's, and it's great to sort of hear your own voice uh, because I, I sort of I didn't really when I, when I first started out I was doing like kind of stand up stuff and it was just talking and poems and stuff back in I used to go to the Frog and Bucket in Manchester and yeah. back in the 90s and stuff and, and I was doing kind of poems and that and um, my mate said uh, he had a piano in his house and uh, back in sort of like 2000 and he just said uh Come and do some, come and sing some Lionel Richie and some Sting. Yeah. And I thought, you know, not not for me. That's <laughs> yeah. not my, you know, yeah. Elton John. No, he yeah. said, yeah, just come. There they are. There's the song. There's yeah. Rocket Man there. Yeah. There's uh, Every Breath You Take and there's yeah. uh, Hello. Is it, yeah. you know, I thought, I'm not seeing it. And, I, and, and there's Peter Gabriel and, and uh, blah, blah. So, not my music at all. But anyway, I started to play the piano and, I, and then I went for it. Yeah. And I was, I felt like, somebody else is like pushing yeah. me out of my body yeah and i thought i don't recognize that voice and he's going man he says that's really and johnny sort of gave me uh confidence to to uh, sing you know and yeah. he just said you know you've, you've got a voice yeah. and i kind of it's it's just finding um the confidence yeah you know, because you think, well, I'm not, I'll stick to what I'm good at, which is I'm, I draw and I do poems and I'm, yeah. and I'm canny and, and trying to be witty and stuff. I'll do that stuff. But when when you sing it, I think there's a case of you have to, there's no hiding place. Yeah. You can't fake us. Well, some, I don't know what, but I know that when I was doing it, I, I, could, I felt really kind of a flush. Yeah. I felt totally exposed. Yeah. But it was quite delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was, it was, a, it was a, a real. Uh, it was a good moment actually because you know it was only last year, and and one of the guys who was there, something kind of came of that night, and he he was he's kind of been writing some musical in in the West End, and he was like, I've got this idea. Would you come and work on one of the uh, workshops? for this musical that we're doing. I was like, oh. and then they told me some of the names that it was involved in it. I was a bit like, kind of almost want to go, I'm just in Emmerdale. And he went, you know, <laughs> sod that, I want you to come and do it. So I, it, it, I came, I went away from that weekend just going, oh my God, this has been a real uh, eye opener for me. Right. So obviously I can, I knew I could, I know I can sing in tune, but it's, it's made me go, maybe there will be a time in my career in the future where I might, get on the stage in the West End and sing. And not, not, it'd have to be that I'm more of a, I'm more of a satirical musical man, you know what I mean? I like something that's a bit tongue in cheek and a bit daft. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the Python stuff would have been, in fact, that was a that was a one that got away kind of thing. I nearly did um, spam a lot years ago. Do you know what oh, I mean? right, yeah. So yeah. that kind of thing, I think, would be, would be more up my street in terms of a musical rather than mm-hmm. something like, oh, I don't know. Something that's all a bit showy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cats. Do you think cats? <laughs> cats, which is apparently a great film. <laughs> <laughs> How different do you think it'd be now if you were starting out now? Like the chances you'd have to work at your craft and work in bars and DJs, because it seems like a lot of themes that you hear from people on the radio is, you know, when we, we I'm in my forties, uh, mixing sixties or early fifties, we mm. we had time to sort of 
be, to you know be a musician, be an actor, and we could sign on. And, and it seems very different now. Even hear people like Brian Eno, big name, saying, you know, if you want to be in the arts, you need to have time, and you can't, you, you know, you need to give it time. But there's a lot of pressure on young people to be working and, you know, get get on the career ladder. So do you think you'd you if if you were twenty one now starting out, I think it'd be a very different landscape. I think it would, yeah. I think it'd be a lot harder. I think there's, there seems to be a pressure. Um, certainly, certainly looking at some of the younger actors that come into to 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 the TV industry, there's a lot of it's all about social media. It would seem, mm. you know what I mean. Um, that's about kind of to create a buzz about yourself and mm. to kind of get your numbers up or get your profile up and for me that's it's something that sits really I don't, I, don't, I don't really like all that kind of side of it so mm-hmm. to have to try and feel like I need to get on that otherwise I might not be helping my career mm-hmm. you know would would really trouble me and make me probably want to pull away from it mm-hmm. and for that reason maybe I, I, I wouldn't uh, be uh, maybe successful if I was I was in nowadays but I was lucky that I you know, I did these these years of 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 um, because I say I had two really tough years to the point, which I didn't talk about before, but I I, I had two tough years where uh, I was going to give it up. Do you know what I mean? The first two years of acting of of leaving drama school was so not much work at all, mm-hmm. and it was thanks to my wife Zoe and and thanks to my mum and thanks to my uncle my uncle John who who just kind of said you know you worked three years at drama school why why are you giving it up because mm. I was just frustrated with the you know sitting on your backside and not doing anything mm. yeah. and there was a period where the phone was going more for DJ than it was for acting which I look back on now and go you, sh- you should have you should have enjoyed that more but I was too f- too busy wanting to be an actor mm. um, but you know but now I get to DJ uh, Every now and then, I get wheeled out for fortieth and fiftieth, and occasionally I get asked to do the odd cool bar. Would you um, play at EastEnders party then? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th- I think uh, I think I, pl- I think I played. I think I may have <clears throat> played at a soap awards one year, and I went over and played a couple of songs. But I was like, "This isn't for me." You know what I mean? So, um, but so, yeah. So like you'd have the, the headphones on, and you'd be and you'd be just yeah. spinning and you'd be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting the drop down. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's no. I think with with what what we all do in in arts and culture, there's no sort of definitive jumping through hoops, is there? Because I met Mick when he was in his uh, 50, 50, I guess, and so I guess I that's your music. On, you know, I, I, I ended up on you know with my foot on the amps at fifty. Yeah, and it just seemed it seemed stupid. Is that when it started for you? Yeah. Well, I, I, I couldn't believe that I was holding a microphone and, and singing with a guitar behind me you know yeah. I mean this is what I wanted to do when I was like yeah. 14 I wanted to be in free or deep purple or something, yeah. You know? yeah. and it took me to like I'm 50 and there's these kids screaming in front of me got absolutely mad yeah yeah <laughs> I'm going what the hell how did they get here what the hell yeah and yeah. it just seems so preposterous yeah but as I say you just it's there so the, you, you can't do anything about it it's not in your control you know, there you are. You wanted to be a singer. There you are. There's a microphone. Sing, and uh, and learn. It happens at different times, do it for people. I think there's no, it, there's no like definitive time. If your career is going to start, it might start when you're late in life, middle of life, start of life. Mm. And... It's just wonderful the chaos mm. yeah. of of a, of a career. Yeah. You know, because I, I I did a degree in theology. I was going to be an RE teacher. Yeah. Back yeah. in in the nineties, and I'd been working on the buildings for four or five years before yeah. that. I'd, did fine art at Bradford College, and I was selling bloody raffle tickets on the street for, for the British Heart Research or something. Yeah. You know, just doing selling lottery tickets, and then I ended up selling ties in Merrion Centre yeah. with an ironing board. You know, six ties for a quid. Because yeah. I just I got sick of being on the dole, and I started to perform in the middle of Merrion Centre and make my rent. And then it was you know, which I'm a dad. Yeah. And I'm on, out drawing on paper bags. And I'm thinking, why am I drawing on paper bags? Why am I making life so difficult? Yeah. Why can't I just get some decent cartridge paper and just sit in a studio yeah. and let people come to me? Why do I have to go out there to this awful pub where the people are just really obnoxious and they're going to, and it'll and hurt me <laughs> <laughs> and draw them? Yeah. Why? I, I'm in Biro. What the, 
are you are you completely masochistic? You know, yeah. but it just kind of um, it felt right. Yeah. You know, so, some things feel right. You just think this is it. I'm basically for better for worse. This is what I am. Yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a whatever. You know, I'm a, I'm a, just an old pussy cat. I'm out there just sniffing around looking for a bit of grub. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, would it be? Is it turned out like you thought it would in that sense? Because you must think, all right, I'm an actor, like in the, in the um, sense that you're acting. Um, it's it's gone through various stages of you know you you kind of do a, a, a kind of drama school. You, you you're a young kid. I was a kind of more mature. I was still I was still young. I was twenty three to twenty six, but I was certainly not one of the kids that straight from school at eighteen nineteen who yeah. were at university. I'd kind of I'd you know I'd worked at various places I'd done that I'd done that kind of traveling around Europe thing I'd done that that summer in Greece and mm. you know I'd, I'd worked in in an accounts office a shirt and tie which I knew wasn't for me <laughs> I'd worked at WH Smith do it all I'd worked in a record shop I'd done all these different things so w- when I when I kind of left drama school I had these you know I want to do this I want to do a British film I want to I want to work I want to work in at the Royal Court I want to do this I want to do that and then within a, like say within a year or two, I was um, I was like, that's not happening for me. You know what I mean? Mm. And that's not really going to happen. So then two years later, because you know I'll be honest, that I was like at, again coming out of drama school. It, call it a snobbishness because we all you're all talking about what you want to do and, and and what what art you you want to you want to do and what and how you want to do it and where you want to do it and. Um, you know, soaps were definitely on, not on the agenda, and <laughs> and and uh, and and also uh, an advert wasn't on the agenda. Mm-hmm. And then within four years, I'd I'd done three adverts, and I was joining a soap. And <laughs> and in my head, I was like, I'm doing this for two years, and then I'm out. Mm-hmm. Six years later, six years flew by. I absolutely loved it, and and then I had those three years out, and then did lots of theatre again, which kind of fed my soul again although I'd, I'd managed to do three plays like I said before the, in, in uh, the, the first six years of Emmerdale and then I came back and then I kind of sat back and relaxed on it a bit more and because I think I'd also spent two of my contemporaries from drama school from, from the, the days at, 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 at drama school with those mates the first six years of Emmerdale I think I was always going yeah I know it's, uh, it's I know it's a soul but and now and now I kind of think it's just been the best job for me and it's mm. it's been such a, a great experience from start to finish and ironically some of those friends that might have been a bit snobby like myself are now kind of going can I can you get me uh, into, can you have a word with the producer again because because they because we've all grown up and we've got families and mm. I, I realize now that this the stability that Emmerdale I never thought I'd have an house I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd have a mortgage but things have changed, and 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 now I look back. And how's, at it. how has how has Kane changed? Since you know, how has how has he? Di- and have you had a different? Yeah, how, how's he changed? Have he, you got a different right to now? Uh, I think. Do you know? I think the three years out was the best thing that ever happened for the character because they, that it created more layers because he went off to Spain, he'd nicked loads of money, and he went to Spain, and then he oh. came back. Mm-hmm. And I think the producer at the time suddenly thought. I want to integrate him into the village because before that he was just this lone kind of maverick who lived above the dingles and grunted at people and didn't speak to anybody apart from his family. Mm. So that in itself was not a realistic existence in a village. People were just after a while go, just ignore him as an idiot. Mm. And I think they did in those, you know, by, by the time we got to six years, I realised that I was just repeating and doing the same kind of scowling around corners and things like that. So when I came back, the producer said, I'm going to put him in the garage. I'm going to make him more accessible in the village and I'm going to have him having a few Plans friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so he's more of a realistic human being. Do you know what I mean? So that's what we did. And I think... Sorry, just, it's just run out there. No, it's fine. I just set this running. Are you... Are you is your stuff? I think, I don't know, I think mine's still going. Okay. I hope. Yeah, go for it. Still going. Look at it. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and then Gavin Blythe, this producer uh, who's no longer with us, sadly, he was just a brilliant guy, and and he, uh, I th- I feel he kind of reinvented him by putting him in the garage and making him more accessible, and and then he became more of a family man, and and, and as the years have gone on, he's he's mellowed, but quite rightly mellowed because 
you know, the older you, you get, do. you do mellow. Yeah. And that's realistic. And I think sometimes you see people who love the show and they go, I prefer him when he was nastier. <laughs> and it's like, but it's not realistic, is it? Yeah. Because if he was like that all the time, certainly within a few years, he'd, he'd do something so bad that he'd have to get written out of the show. Yeah, because so, I mean, soaps are known for like mir- mirroring contemporary culture. Out so, so if people are mellowing as they get older, that's going to be reflected in the in the soaps character, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you ever think you'd? Was it in one of the red top tabloids where it had a, th- a, f- a free Deirdre thing when Deirdre got sent to prison yeah. in Coronation Street? And it's funny how it's uh, interesting how soap characters become real people beyond characters. Did mm. you ever think that? might happen to you or I don't know but um, I think for some people who watch them they are you know I think they are they can be that there's certainly a form of escapism that, that people like and, and and if if you uh, you stay in the show for long enough I think um, people warm to your character I know that people won't have liked my characters to start with but now he's been in it that long I think that any other villains come in I think they're like Kane will sort him out <laughs> do you know what I mean so I've become this kind of anti-hero almost yeah. you know what I mean that kind of will will sort out the other wrong ones that come in the show because yeah. I've been there for long enough you know? yeah yeah <laughs> well yeah I mean you yeah so who who have you I, I've I've looked to I've, I've sat there and I've watched people uh, I've, I've sketched little people while I've been sort of sitting on my chair and I've watched people like uh, Freddie yeah uh, the old guy um, uh, Freddie Jones Freddie yeah. Jones and I just remember him from like Hammer horror films and Amazing. stuff, and, yeah. and he's just his his fruity delivery. Yeah, and he was so oh yummy. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to eat him. And yeah, he just it was like a big cake. Yeah, of he was rich. Yeah, and he just he, you know you could smell life off him. You could yeah. smell humiliation. You know, dodgy dealings, love, everything. Yeah. you know, he just radiated. Yeah. you know, he burned with with life, and uh, and what's what what's it like when somebody like that turns up? You know, because he's he's quite surprised. Like Patrick Moore turned up, you know, yeah. and, and there's, there's a Patrick uh, Patsy Kenzie turned up, Patsy and this is, yeah. they're from like sort of like a, across the stream or something, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's, it's really surprising to sort of see them in this. You think how come he's he's in Emmerdale? You know, because he's like well, Michael just, Prade who came in recently, who was you know uh, certainly a period in my life where my my mother was watching um, Robin the Hooded Man and then he went on into oh God, Dynasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden Michael Pratt and they're, they're lovely. And, they're, and then when they're uh, somebody like Michael as well, who's just so, such a beautiful man and a, a well, great person. There's a sparkle that yeah. comes. There's yeah. something a bit exotic Stories, yeah. that there's, happens, in the, you know, which is probably a good thing, I suppose. Maybe yeah. there's, it's considered, you know, it will, well, yeah, that'll do. That will, that will uh, add a bit of uh, spice to you know, this next few months, whatever. Yeah, I suppose that because they're a kind of rolling thing, you get young, uh, young actors and you get really established actors coming in and coming out and it's this continuing thing that's almost like a, a perpetual thing. Mm. So it's a great for that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the people that, that, that come in, I mean, I think people are, actors are, uh, found on there and and, 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 and and come to notoriety on there and then some move on and some stay there um, and then uh, young actors come in and, and cut the teeth and then move on and go into other things and then you know some older actors from like you say from what seemed like across the pond and from a different a different kind of um, a different stratosphere almost come in and you go you know the, the amount of actors <laughs> you, know, you know, industry people that went, am I right? Is Freddie Jones in Emmerdale? And you're like, yes, he is. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, wow. You know, and, yeah. and like you say, Mick, to watch him there, sometimes his delivery, you go, that is so massive. <laughs> but everything had such intention, every vowel, consonant, everything was hit and had and was just delivered mm. b- beautifully. Yeah. And, and it was just a joy to sit. And, and he could, he would, he would sit sometimes and just... I mean, it sounds such like an actor thing to do, but you'd just be mesmerised. He'll just literally go and say one of the one of the sonnets, one of Shakespeare sonnets, and just reel it off. And he, they're all there in his brain. They're wow. all there. They just and he and he and he do do some kind of 
Frankie Howard, he'd, yeah. he'd just drop a line, yeah. Yeah. Some, something just kind of cheeky yeah. and, and, and witty, of course, yeah. darling. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's so lovely, you know, yeah. but it was, it was just kind of what it needed sometimes, you know, yeah. just kind of brought a little uh, strangeness yeah. to, you know, the wool pack. Yes, no, <laughs> to the wool pack, this, exactly. The likes yeah. of this transvestite, <laughs> yeah. darling. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 he's great. Jeff. Have you got a recommended album for this week? What? Uh, just just a recommended album? Just a, 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 yeah. a go-to? It doesn't have to be a favourite one, you know. It can just, just something that's kind of cooking in the, in the back of the oven. <laughs> that, you just, that you might have been singing about three days ago. Mm. Um, I'd have to look on my phone to see what I've got. I think Let's make it up. Uh, I, if, I mean, if I was if I was going to go to uh, a, a, a go to kind of classic for me would be something like the Village Green Preservation Society by the, the Kings. Oh, around, uh, it's just a great English album. I've never, you know, I've never heard it, but my, my ambition is to buy it. I've always thought because so it, it's a double album, isn't it? It's full of. It's all about. Uh, is it, um, just, just, just about Crickle, what is it? Oh, is, yeah, is that it's just about Eng- it's just about England. It's just, yeah. it's just very English. And at this time of the year, when they, when you've got a bit of uh, sun, a bit of sun, um, it's a it's a great album. That, that would be an album for for now. Yeah. That would be a perfect way to just sit and just yeah. and ponder. Yeah. And I'll just stick it on. Stick yeah. Ray Davis on now. Yeah. Two sides of that. Four sides. Oh, thanks, Jeff, for coming on the Ego Podcast, and thanks to you listeners for tuning in. Jeff Hordley and Zoe, his wife, have done a short film on CBBC about the benefits of gardening. And further details can be found at Twitter, at Hordley Jeff, Facebook, Jeff Hordley UK. You can listen to this again and download this podcast on iTunes, Mick Artistic's Ego Podcast. Further links can be found on our website, mickartistic.com. See you on the road and on the waves next time. Bye. (laughs)